haven't done this in quite a while, but I started thinking, you know, we used to do like a meet and greet where we went around, this is pre-COVID, uh, we used to go around and actually talk to each other, and I know that we talk to each other after the service, but I want you to take a minute just to go and greet your neighbor and say, hey, it's good to see you here today. Go ahead and do that right now. such a beautiful sight. Woo. I love you guys fellowshipping. We're going to keep worshiping today. I remember those melodies the words we sang when I first believed. Songs of redemption, stories of hope, heaven awakened inside my soul. In Christ alone, my solid Darkest night, sweet hands of freedom. 
in my quiet time, I, I feel like God keeps giving me this one word, and that's available. So every time, every time that word available pops up in Scripture, I, I look at, I, I, it, it pops out to me. So I was reading in Jeremiah 29, 11, and, and God, and, and usually what I'll do is read, you know, t verse 10, 11, 12, 13, and just get a context for what's going on around it. And in Jeremiah 29, 13, I wrote this down. It says, when you seek me in prayer and worship, this is what we're doing today. When you seek me in prayer and worship, you will find me available. You will find me available. This is God. You will find God available to you if you seek him with all your heart and your soul. If you seek him with all your heart and your soul. When you seek me in prayer and worship, you will find me available to you if you seek me with all your heart and soul. So are you seeking him this morning with all your heart and soul? Let's pray. Jesus, I just want to thank you for your word. Because you give us promises. That if, if we don't have your word to stand on, we're making up our own little religion. Um, and, we, and we can't do that. So I thank you that you give us your word to stand on. To, that you give us promises, Lord, that when, when we do seek you, you're there. You give us all sorts of promises. Lord, let us stand on your word, stand firmly on your word. And God, as we move into a time of worshiping with our tithes and our offerings, I pray that you would take those tithes and offerings. I pray that you would bless it and multiply it and to further your kingdom, Lord, because it's all about you and it's all about bringing people to know you and, and walking in a closer relationship with you every day. The world wants to tear us apart and move us further away from you. But we're here to be intentional about worshiping you. So Lord, fill this place with your holy presence. Fill our souls with your holy presence. Fill us up. Lord, we're not here to, we're really not here to receive. We're here to give. We're here to give our worship. Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
because that is who you are. You are a way maker. You are a miracle worker, Lord. And in every single life, if we just look, you're working. If we would just look, if we would just, just focus our eyes on you, Lord, we would see you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you don't, you don't leave us alone. You don't, you love your creation. So, Lord, I pray that you would wrap your arms around us today. Love on us today. God, we love you so much. I want to lift up our pastor. I pray that you would put a special anointing on him, on his lips, as he, as he brings a message from you, Lord. Make us a sponge just to soak up that every drop, Lord. Everything, that the thing that we need to hear, let us hear it. And let us walk away changed and filled up. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, I don't know about Ooh. you, but that's powerful. Powerful. Ooh. Good stuff. Okay. Got a little feedback, a little echo here, guys. <clears throat> oh, it's good to be with you today. Good to be back in at Salem and, and be here to worship and praise God. I look out over this crowd and I thank God for this opportunity to bring his word to you uh, so that uh, we can be together. I want to begin with a prayer, and then we're going to begin our time of worship. So let's pray. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you for the time that uh, you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for all the many blessings, and we thank you that we are here today, Lord. I pray that the words that I say that will be words that we need to hear as your children, Lord. Open our hearts, open our minds in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, again, I want to welcome you and those who are joining us online. I, I tell you, uh, that is a great thing, online service. I got to watch Colin, you know, and hear him and, and, and listen to our praise band online. And, and that was a blessing coming down the mountain, so I appreciate that. And I'm glad you're joining us online. This morning, <clears throat> I'm actually following the lectionary series, if you, if you keep up with lectionary. Uh, if you don't, uh, I'm coming from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, which is the 10th chapter, verses 24 through 39. Excuse me just a moment. Okay? All right. Hold on there just a minute. Go a little fast. Okay. Now, I want to be truthful with you this morning. Okay? If you're familiar with this passage, it's a very troubling passage of Scripture. Okay? Now, when I first read the lectionary, I always start with my sermons. I read through the lectionary, and then I ask God to, to show me a line. I didn't want to preach this. Okay? I didn't want to preach this message because it's a message that I don't like. I don't like it. You know why? Because it talks about division and it talks about conflict. Okay? And division and conflicts are, are something I don't need any more of in my life. Okay? In my personal life, I've got enough division and conflict to have to deal with. I don't want to have to deal with it in my spiritual life as well. Okay? But that's just not the way it is. Listen to this passage of Scripture. Throw it up there now. Okay? Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? I've come to not to bring peace, 
but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Now, folks, those are the words of Jesus. Now, I thought Jesus was supposed to be about all this peace and love. And, and that doesn't sound very peaceful. And where in the world is the love in those words? But folks, to understand this passage of Scripture, we've, we've got to back up a little bit. We've got to back up and look at it in, in kind of its entirety. Okay, Jesus, the larger conversation, Jesus is having with his disciples. And he's talking about discipleship here. He's talking about discipleship. And so I have to back up to Matthew chapter 9 if you want to back up. Pardon me, to chapter 9. And, and where we find in, in, in chapter 9 is Jesus is healing people. Jesus is healing the paralytic. He calls Matthew, of course, who's the tax collector, and Matthew gets up and leaves his tax book behind and follows Jesus. He restores the sight to some blind men. He, he heals another one who's mute. Now, as a result of all this, people are beginning to gather around Jesus, Okay. I mean, they're beginning to follow him around. The crowds are beginning to get larger and larger. Now, that's in chapter 9. And if we go to chapter two, ten, excuse me, here's what happens. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to cure every disease and every sickness. Jesus gives his disciples the authority to heal the sick and restore the broken. The disciples. The scripture says all 12 of them. Now you know who's all 12 of them, right? You know the 12 disciples. Okay? He entrusts them with the power that they've witnessed for their own eyes. They've seen Jesus do these miracles and, and heal people. And now he says, I'm giving you this power. I'm giving you this authority. And then he begins to talk to the disciples, and he says, now this is how it's going to take place. This is the shape of this new ministry that's going out in the world. And this is what it's going to look like. So Jesus calls them to step out boldly in faith, and here's what he says. He says, now as you go, I want you to proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. You know where we first hear those words, don't you? What's well, John as he comes out of the wilderness? He's telling them, the kingdom of heaven has come near. And now Jesus is sending the disciples out, and he's sending them out. If you go back and look at the passage, he's sending them out with nothing. He's sending them out with the shirt on their back. They've got no gold, they've got no copper, they've got nothing. And he sends them out and he says, now here's what I'm doing. I'm going to give you the authority. I want you to do this. I want you to cure. I want you to raise the dead. I want you to cleanse the leopards. I want you to cast out demons. And I want you to proclaim the good news. Now can you imagine how they must have felt? They had to rely solely, completely, fully on Jesus. On what he says. They had to entrust their lives with him and he also tells them, he says, there'll be those who will receive you, and those that receive you, I want you to stay and be with them. And those that, that won't receive you, you shake off the dust off your feet and go on. Move on. Jesus warns them that you're also going to be attacked. You're going to be attacked for what you believe and what you say. Jesus says these words. He says, listen, see, I, I'm sending you out as, as sheep, like sheep, into the midst of wolves. Now, imagine that scene. So he says, listen to me. I want you to be wise as serpents, and I want you to be innocent as doves. He says, beware of them. For they're going to hand you over to councils. They're going to flog you in their synagogues. And you're going to be dragged before governors and kings because of me. Because of me. As a testimony to them and the Gentiles. Now, now Jesus is sharing with them 
what's going to take place. She's going to tell them what's happening in the future. What will happen. But suddenly, suddenly, this, this trip that seemed like, oh man, this is great. All of a sudden, this trip's beginning to take on a little bit of a different appearance, isn't it? You see, they're going to have to begin to question. Am I going to be, I, will, I take, will I do this? Can I do this? Do I even want to do this? All these things. They're going to be persecuted. They're going to have to endure suffering. Simply because what they did and what they shared. See, it, it clearly shows us that the world that we live in, this world has always struggled with the good news message. Has always struggled with Jesus. I mean, why is, why is that message so difficult to receive? Why is it so difficult for us to accept the message, the good news message? Why? You know, many, the scriptures tell us that there were crowds. We, we read the story of, of 5,000 men on the hill, not counting the women and children. Crowds around Jesus. What were they there for? What are many gather around Jesus for? The benefits, folks. The benefits. But they want the benefits without what really, truly comes with discipleship. And what comes with the discipleship is conflict, is persecution, yeah, is suffering. That's what Jesus is saying. For those in the world, the world that we live in, there are some that are just going to flat out say, I don't want to hear any of that. Don't talk to me about Jesus. I don't want to hear it. They're going to reject it immediately and walk away. And then there's others that's going to hear the word and, and hear the good news message. And you know what we're going to do with it? We're going to wrestle with it. We struggle with it. To understand. To comprehend. That's what we do with it. We wrestle it. What does it mean to, to, to live in the, in the teachings and the ways of Christ? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ. And we struggle with that. And how do we live it in our lives? And how do we live it in the world that we live in? I want to move on to our passage. Jesus then says these words. He says, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave to be like the master. Now, there's two words there that you understand that, that, that's used, Jesus uses, teacher and master. Teacher and master. And when you go back and look, the question becomes, well, who is your teacher? And the other question is, who is your master? Okay? That's a question that we have to constantly continue to ask ourselves. Who is our teacher and, and who is our master? You see, the disciples would go back to the passage where Jesus sends them out. The disciples, they had no power. They had no authority. They couldn't do anything on their own. That power was given to them from the Master. From Jesus, He gave them that power. And the words that those disciples spoke, that good news message that they brought to the world, where did that come from? came from the teacher Jesus words Jesus taught him now listen to me the power the power that lies within the church the Christian church today where is that power folks it's not among the people the power is not among the people the power is from the master and Christ alone that's where we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. 
and the teachings, the teachings that we share are not your teachings or, or they're not my teachings, but that which we take from Jesus, his words. Remember what he says to the disciples? Here's what he says. He says, listen, go therefore, and I want you to make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? Where's the power come from? You, me? No. It comes from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's where it comes from. There's where the power lies. That's why he says baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, listen here, you're not done yet. Teaching them to obey what? Everything that I, I have commanded you. There it is. As disciples of Christ, we are called to share and to teach not my ways, not your ways, but the ways of Christ. The ways of Christ. Now the second part of that scripture in, in Matthew 10, and, and it's a, lays a little bit like uh, Colin was sharing last week with you, okay? It begins and it says this. It says, is, it is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. See, we, we've got enough to do, okay? And that is to seek to live like the master. To teach like the master. That's why he says it's enough there. And, and you might say, well, listen, you know, I can't do this. While all power and authority belongs to Christ and Christ alone, we, we, we're not to just simply throw in the towel and say, I might as well give up. The world wins. We can't do that. We shouldn't say, well, what's the use? Nothing changes. But we should continue to press on. And when we fall down, we need to get back up. And we should always, always try to seek to live and to be like Christ. So that when others look at us, and when they're looking for direction and guidance, that they will see Christ living in us and be drawn to Christ through that light that's seen in us. Folks, I, I said a couple weeks ago, listen to me. Let me tell you something. Following Christ, becoming a disciple of Christ, is not going to make you popular. And it's not going to win you many votes. Okay? If you think you need to do something else. Okay? I mean, look at all that Jesus did while he walked on this earth. Healing and, and, and casting out demons and... And, and, and instead of, of loving him, what happens? He faces hate. They hate him. He's questioned. They doubt him. Even among the twelve, he has one that's disloyal to him. And he suffered physical pain and suffering even to the point of death on a cross. So Jesus says these words. He says, if they have called me the master of the house of Beelzebub, then how much more will they malign those of his household? Now, folks, Jesus speaks this a little before his time, okay? It's a little before, because here's my point. Following Jesus is conflicting, and it creates division. So we either fear it, or we can't, or maybe we're unwilling to understand it, and we struggle with this change, okay? Now, at the time of Jesus, the people themselves, they, they were suffering. They were struggling, okay? Now, if you flip over in the passage Matthew 12, 24, or if you go to Luke eleven fifteen, or if you go to John 8, 48, okay? Listen, Jesus heals a demonic man. Now look what the scriptures say. The scripture says that when he heals this demonic man, when the Pharisees heard it, they said it is only Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, that this fellow cast out the demons. Why do you think Jesus speaks this earlier? He says, listen, 
Listen, people are going to misunderstand it. They're going to think you're, that, that, you're, that you're of the devil. Of the... So we either, we either fear it or, 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 or we don't understand it. As I said at the time of Jesus, as far as the people, the people were suffering. They were struggling. They were hurting. The common everyday people on the street, but the religious community was alive and well. Alive and well. And then Jesus shows up. And Jesus shows up, and, and, and the religious leaders, I guess they were just going to welcome Jesus into their fold, but instead Jesus said, oh, buddy, you know, things have got to change. And they begin pointing out the things that needed to change. And all of a sudden, Jesus started causing trouble. And he began challenging the status quo, challenging the way people thought and the things that people did. And Jesus reminds the disciples that their ministry is going to compete with, with, with many of the social structures and the beliefs that contributed to life within the first century. Okay? And it's going to compete with the economic and the social structures that tolerate neglect and abuse. I, I can only imagine what the disciples were thinking at that time. You want us to go up against those that we, 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 we sat at under their feet and listened to that shared scriptures with us and, and all this. And I mean, folks, listen, there, there's a fear in conflict. Let's, let's be honest. When there's division and conflict, there's, there's a, a fear there. Perhaps sensing all that, here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, have no fear of them. Have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will be made known. Now what I say to you in the dark, tell them the light, and what you hear, whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Now, listen. Jesus is talking about something that's about to come about, okay, that will, a future tense, if you would. You see, Jesus, you remember, as I shared with you, he was regarded as a, as a, a teacher, as a master, as a rabbi, as one who taught with authority. But yet the people rejected his words, didn't they? rejected what he had to say they turned a deaf ear to how he had to say but then if you go to the crucifixion as he hung there and he cried out that last thing and said it is finished there's a centurion at the foot of the cross and he speaks these words and he says listen he says Surely, surely, this is a righteous man, not deserving mercy. The truth came out, did it not? Now flip over to Acts. Flip over to Acts. Okay? And what happens? Peter stands up and does he say, folks, listen, here the way. No, he tells them like it is. You crucified him. You beat him. You nailed him to a cross. And three days later, he rose again. He spoke the truth. And because he spoke the truth, there were thousands, thousands whose eyes were opened and their ears were opened and they heard the truth and they come to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord. Listen, let me continue here. It says this. It says, do not fear those who who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Those are not my words. Listen to me. Jesus is talking about persecution. He's talking about the pain, the suffering that they're going to face. He's telling his disciples. Okay? But Jesus reminds them, he says, don't fear that. Okay? 
Here's what he says. When he said about, about the, but fear the one who can destroy both the body and the soul. Okay? That read, take that fear and change that word to respect and honor and trust. Put in there what you want to, okay? Those who can both destroy the soul. Put your faith in the one. You got to decide. Discipleship, listen, folks, let me tell you something. Discipleship is not for the faint of heart. It's not. I'm sorry. But look what Jesus says. Listen to him. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Now think about that. Let's go on to the next one. It says, Even the hairs of your head are all counted. And so do not be afraid. You are more value than these sparrows. Do, do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, listen, you're going to face this persecution. People are going to hate you. They're going to say all kinds of things about you. Stand firm. Why? Because God loves you. He said, God loves you. Did you hear me, church? God loves you. And you are a value. And you are worth. You were created in the image of God. You were given the very breath of God and brought to life. So believe and trust and know that no matter what you go through, no matter what you have to endure, yes, God knows your struggles. God knows and cares what you've been through and, and where you're going. And you, are, you hold a great value in God's eyes. Jesus then says these words. He says, everyone, everyone therefore who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever, whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do I need to explain that? Huh? Yeah. Listen, folks. We acknowledge Christ by what we say, by what we do, by what others see. The question becomes, does our lives reveal to others the love of Christ? Now think about that. You've read it. Christ loved us while we were yet sinners, proving God's love toward us. Okay? The words that we say, the way that we act. What about that? Now, now here's where it's going to begin to get a little difficult for us, okay? And, and, and I don't know, I don't know if the crowd listened to these words and, and maybe they begin to fall away. That's kind of in my mind. I see at, at the closer Jesus got to the cross, the fewer and the fewer and the fewer followed him. Huh? Yeah. They didn't want to know that. I don't want to know that conflict. I don't want to know that problems. But here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, do not think, again, this is what I read in the beginning, do not think I've come priest to the world, earth. I've come to bring, I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against the mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's household. Now listen, he goes on, he says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. What's he saying? Listen, I want, I want my children to love me. I, I, don't, I, don't wanna, I don't like disagreements in my family. I want my grandchildren to love me. I don't want disagreements with, and conflict with my grandchildren. Okay? But I've got to die to myself. That's what he's saying. When you take up the cross, you die to yourself. And you live for Christ. You're born again. Yeah. And Jesus is telling us, he said, listen, 
this is, this is hard to hear. This good news is hard to hear. And it's hard to apply. And it's not what everyone is willing to hear. Now listen to me very carefully. We don't stop loving them. Okay? We continue to love. Let me tell you something. Go back. Remember there was two criminals on the cross? Jesus loved them. God loved them. Loved them and loved them and loved them. And the one, the one turned and said, remember me. And I believe, I believe that today he was with the one that says, this day you will be with me in paradise. God doesn't give up on us, does he? He loves us in spite of who we are, our ugliness. Yeah. That good news is hard to hear sometimes. And even some of those closest to us, even those that we, say, we share the same blood, the same genes with. Okay? It's hard. This message is going to divide families as well as friends. I mean, look, 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 at, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. He begins his ministry. He comes into town, and what do they do? They welcome. Hometown boy makes good. They say, hey, come on up here and read from these scrolls. And he goes up and he reads from the scrolls. And after he reads from the scrolls, what does he do? He proclaims the message. And what happens? Well, he didn't welcome him. The scripture says they got angry and mad about it. And they drove him out of the synagogue. And, 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 and they tried to get him to the top of the hill and throw him off a cliff to kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Now, earlier, earlier I showed to you that... that, that uh, you know, when we stand with Christ, it's not going to, even with our family, Jesus, remember I told you he was accused of being a, a demonic, of being the devil. And in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 3, 21, okay, they come to Jesus' family and they say, you need to restrain him. Why? For people were saying that he's gone out of his mind. They sent his family, his brothers, his sisters, to restrain him, put him away. Listen to me. Are, are you willing to face such conflict? Are you willing to face that today? Listen, our reading today, it reminds us that this discipleship journey is a journey of faith that shapes and transforms our lives. Okay? I can't change you. There's nothing that I can say. There's nothing that I can do that can change you. Okay? Only God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, can change a person. And He says that if we'll open ourselves up to Him, that He will transform us. We will be born anew. Born again. Yeah. A discipleship of Christ, it's not a job or occupation. Okay? It's not a nine to five job. It is who we are as Christians. Now, for those first disciples, as they prepared to make their journey into the world, Jesus offered them this wise advice and he reminded them that they couldn't pick and choose. Who was worthy? He sends them out to the world, doesn't he? So again, when we consider the social and political trends that, that shape our world, I think this reading has much to say. You know, uh, and I've said it in so many different occasions, the church must be the voice. It's not a building. It's not a structure. It's the disciples of Christ. We proclaim that the kingdom is near to those who need to hear that message. We're called to give consideration to the poor and the needy, the neglected, the isolated. And it doesn't matter who they are, their nationality, religious convictions, or their income. We are called to stand firm even when it is costly. Yes, there's going to be divisions. Divisions in our family, in our church, and in our nation. 
Now listen, our, our reading in Matthew, uh, the scripture passage actually ends with this. And here's what Jesus says. He says, those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Now, now, now mull over that just a minute. Those who find their life will lose it. The life that Jesus is referring to there is, is, is those who take up the cross to become disciples of Christ. You remember the words of Jesus, don't you? What does he say? I'm the way. I'm the truth. I am the life. Okay? When we take up our cross, it means when we die to self and, and, and we live for Christ. There is no life without Christ. There's only an existence. Now Jesus continues, of course, and he says those who find their life in Christ will lose it. Yeah. What's he talking about? Well, first of all, you're going to die to the ways of the world. Okay? You have to die to the ways of the world. And you may even die at the hands of the world through suffering and persecution. Yet those who lose their life for my sake will find it. What's Jesus doing? He's offering an invitation. The good news message. Don't sound much like good news, it? but he's offering us life, eternal life. So when we die to self, we will rise again in him who gives us eternal life. We will be born again. And I want to finish reading uh, this passage a little further down. It's actually 40 through 42. And here's what it says. This is how we are to be. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. You got that, right? And whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of a righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. Now, I see Jesus, and there he is. And he's talking with the disciples, and people are gathered around, all around him. And here are all these little children coming up. That, you know, to, uh, there, and, and Jesus is saying, whoever offers a cup of water to one of these little ones, one of these little ones, the least, the last, and the lost, that's who the children were, okay? In the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. I'm going to try this. I don't know if it's going to work out, but I just felt led. Bear with me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. Give me a, give me a key there. I, I, I've lost my pen. <laughs> give me a note there. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. I'm just going to read it. I've lost it. See, I'm, to, I'm tone deaf. I'm sorry. Uh, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking shall come with trumpet sound may I then in him dwell in him my righteousness alone faultless to stand before on Christ a solid rock I stand all other 
day comes. Pray that I will stand with him. In Christ alone, my solid rock. Let's pray. Oh, loving God, forgive me for where I failed you. Forgive us where we have failed you as a church. Free us, oh God, that we will stand with you. That no matter what we face and what we do, that we'll always remember that it is on Christ, the solid rock, that we stand. Yes, and all other ground, all other ground is sinking sand. The scriptures tell us that the world one day will dissolve away and be gone no more. But those who stand on that solid rock will continue to live and continue to be. Lord, our Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Pray your presence upon us this day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's all stand and worship.
let's go. Yeah, now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. You turn grace into God.